Um, this is this is the outline of my talk uh, because this I was told that this talk is going to be followed by many students. Um, then I decided to spend some time for the introduction, which is going to be about the basics interaction in these uh, materials and uh, in particular in metals near the quantum critical point. This part of the talk might be a bit boring for the expert, but uh, I think I need to do this for to make my point and uh, to explain you why there is no there, are, there is no such an effect in metallic system. The second part of my talk will be about uh, the slow and fast relaxation regime is these materials, and uh, the third part will be about the finally the experimental results that we obtain on this particular system. Now I would like to start from the very beginning uh, to explain the main concept behind quantum criticality. So, and this can be done easily by plotting a standard phase diagram of an order system in which we have a temperature on the y axis and a parameter that could be magnetic field pressure um, that can suppress a, a, a transition between a disorder state which will be, for instance, in a paramagnetic material, the paramagnetic state, and the order state uh, could be a ordered ferromagnetic, antiferromagnetic state, or any kind of order. Now, we know uh, this transition, if second order, is driven by thermal fluctuations. And we know almost all about it. And uh, uh, the, the, the point here is that if we can suppress this transition temperature, to very low temperature in the phase diagram, then of course the thermal fluctuations are very small. And then the transition between the order and not order states can be driven by quantum fluctuation. Uh, the, uh, there are two points which are really to uh, effect, which are really very important here. First is this quantum fluctuation, the effect of this fluctuation can be seen well above this transition, this, regi this region here. This first point. The second point, this uh, fluctuation can drive an other state of matter, other phase of matter, like uh, unconventional superconductivity. That's why the, there is a lot of interest on material which can be driven by a uh, parameter to a quantum critical point. Now, the question we want to answer today is not only what's going on here at the critical point, but what, what is the role of the nuclear degrees of freedom near this point? Of course, because the nuclear moments are very small, the energy scale of this effect is very low of the order of millikelvin and microkelvin. That's why, of course, not important high temperature. But then the question is, what happens if we go low in temperature? What do the nuclear spin uh, do and uh, what is the effect to the quantum critical fluctuation here? There is a very nice, so I took this phase diagram from a very nice um, paper by Eike Eisenlaw and Matthias Voiter. They discuss the role of nuclear degrees of freedom mostly in insulators. And the reason why they do that, because there is indeed an experimental evidence for this um, effect, which is the system lithium on fluoride. This is a ferromagnetic easing, a an easing ferromagnet, which can be uh, at with a TC, so a Curie temperature 1.5 Kelvin. The order state can be driven to zero by a transverse field. So from the theory is well known, and, and you expect to have like a critical field going down here to about 40, but then you see this stay in the phase time. And this is because the uh, nuclear degrees of feed of Holmium, which spin seven half, if I well recall, then they play, they shift the phase transition to higher field. So this is discussed um, in this paper, but in this paper, there are also very general consideration about symmetry property and so on, which can be used for metallic system. Now, we do have evidence of role of nuclear moments in quantum critical system. That's in insulator. So my 
what I'm going to argue is that in metals it's almost impossible. And I'll try now to explain why and give you then an example in which we, on the other hand, found one example. Now I'm going now to the, uh, introduce the main, the basics interaction present in metallic systems. So the main actors uh, in this story are the conduction electron with spin S, the 4F electrons with angular momentum J, and the nuclei with spin I. So this is important that we talk about 4F electrons because the 4F electrons are very localized. So they are very near the nucleus. So then the hyperfine coupling between this and the nuclei is very strong. So that what I'm going now to present is all about metallic system with elements that contain F electrons. Now I try to visualize that in a very schematic picture is not, of course, uh, it doesn't respect the reality, but um, if you, so this is like a little simplified picture in which we have the nuclear here, then we have the four shell surrounding the nuclear is not spherical, but in my, I didn't want to be more sophisticated. And then the connection ledger. Now there are three important interactions we need to consider here. The first is the condo exchange interaction, which couple the spin of the electrons to the spin of the 4F electrons. Then there is the Y exchange interaction, which couple the spin of the 4F with another 4F elements in a, uh, in a crystal lattice. And then we have the very important hyperfine interaction, which couple the nuclei spin with the angular momentum of the 4F. So the interplay between these three interaction is now, uh, I'm going now to talk about this and explain you in which case is one of the interactions more important and uh, prevail to the others. Now, I uh, would like now to introduce the free interaction to give you some example. Now, the 4F electrons, as I said, are pretty well localized. So the energy level is pretty far away from the uh, Fermi level in a metal. Now, if the 4F level is not very far away, then you may have what is called the direct hybridization. So you can exchange charge and spin between conduction electron and the electrons on the 4F. So that means that the valence of the 4F atoms change a lot. And these material are called intermediate valence system. But then if the 4F is pretty low in energy, then you cannot have this kind of direct hybridization. But still, you can have a very small perturbation, which allowed you to have a spin flip between the exchange between the um, conduction electrons and the 4F. This little perturbation then gives you then at the end some two configuration, which will be the spin up on the 4F and spin down on the conduction electrons and vice versa. So this kind of perturbation is the core of the of the condo effect and give you some kind of spin, what is called, or some people like to call a spin flip between the conduction electron and the 4F. If this effect is very uh, coherent and very effective, so if you have a lot of density of state at the Fermi level, then what happens is that this effect screen completely the 4F moment. So the ground state of a condo system is a singlet ground state. Now, it is not a pretty simple, uh, uh, let's say, non-magnetic metallic state, but the density of state at the energy level is pretty much enhanced. And system with a large condo temperature, they are usually known as fem heavy fermiosif liquids because then the uh, density of state at the Fermi level is much higher than those of the simple metals. So this is proportional to the effective mass and we have in principle metallic system with a huge effective mass. Now, um, there are many properties associated with this um, 
with this effect. But what I would like to point out that is important for my talk today is only the rate at which the spin flip mechanism takes place. Now, the conduct temperature, which is the energy at which this effect start to be uh, effective, is proportional to the exponential of the density of the phase Fermi level and the exchange interaction. And it's, there are, so the conduct temperature could be from one Kelvin up to 100 or Kelvin. If we take, for instance, a standard condo system with a condo temperature of 10 Kelvin, then we can work out that the fluctuation of this, this spin flip fluctuation of, of the order of 200 gigahertz. So if you want to measure this, you need to go to Terra S spectroscopy. Okay, so uh, this number, we need this number a bit later for to explain uh, um, the faster relaxation regime. Now, the second interaction is so-called Ruderman kittel kasuya yoshida interaction, the Ekakawa interaction, which couple two 4F moments in a lattice, which are a distance of R apart. Now, the main principle, the mechanism is the first magnetic moment polarize the electrons in an oscillation way such that the coupling very near the moment is ferromagnetically, then antiferro and so on. So the magnetic moment polarizes the electrons that polarize the second uh, magnetic 4F moment. So they give us, um, at the end, you have an uh, antiferro and magnetic order at state. And the temperature at which this uh, effect is observed is from very small temperature up to 10 Kelvin. And uh, what is important here is that this effect is proportional to the square of the exchange interaction, so the conduct exchange interaction, and also to the density of state. So the more electrons, the higher the temperature. Now, to combine all these two effects, what people usually like to do is to uh, plot the what is called uh, Donier's phase diagram. Now, you have two transition, so the transition temperature given by the ordering, which is the Ayakaka Y temperature, and then the condo temperature, which screens the magnetic building a singlet. So if this temperature is higher than the condo temperature, you have a magnetic ordering. So that's not important for what I'm going to tell you today. If the condo temperature is very high, you have a heavy Fermi liquid uh, non-magnetic ground state. And we also don't, um, it's not important for uh, my talk today. But if this temperature very close to each other, then you have a situation in which the system is on the verge between the order state and non-order state. And this is the quantum critical point. Now, I would like to point it out here that at this point, this is a schematic phase diagram. It's not exactly this, but at this point, the quantum criticality of the system has a relative high condo temperature. Now, I turn now to the third interaction, which is a bit more complicated. That's why I decided to give you a direct example how it works. And I have chosen a system that we started a few years ago. It's a Prasiodimus system. And um, uh, in Prasiodimus system, the angular momentum J is 4. There is a big, a very large uh, nuclear spin. 100% abundance of these isotopes, the 141. And the A, so the hyperfine coupling, is pretty large. It's something like 50 millikel. So, and this is a, a, a cubic cage compound. So I'm going to show here a picture from our paper here. So if you put one of the prasodymium atom inside this cage, then the crystal field split the J4 um, energy levels in four uh, groups. And the first, the ground state is a triplet a magnetic tri triplet. Then the first excited state is the doublet, and so on. There are two positions for prosodymium, so the situation is different from here to here, but we just focus now on that. 
Now, if we switch on the epiphy interaction, this material, then you couple the J of the 4F of prosodymium with the nuclear moment. So the nuclear is five halves, you have six levels. So what you end up here are four, 10, 18 levels split by different energy. And the wave function at every of these level are <clears throat> uh, a couple electrons and nuclear wave function. So they are pretty quantum mechanically entangled. So there is a big difference of difference of having the nuclei completely independent from the 4F or having they complete, uh, completely entangled with this energy. Now, how can we measure this effect? The first thing you can do, you can measure heat capacity. So if we look at the numbers here, we have uh, 700 millikelvin that you say, OK, I can measure E capacity and measure the excitation from zero for the ground state. So we did this. And I'm sorry, this is a pretty complicated picture. I took this from the publication. But the only important um, uh, curve you need to, to look at is this here. So we have measured the E capacity of this material, and we found this behavior. There are two phase transition, one magnetic and one this quadrupolar transition. But the, what is important is a, a huge background below this transition. This is given exactly from these levels, epiphyte levels. So if you take the entropy below this uh, peak, is exactly RLN 18. So you can, coming back to this effect, if this effect is uh, takes place in your material, you can, in many material, uh, or in particular material with F electron, you can measure this because it's in the range of millikelvin. And the effect is straight and very large to be seen. There is another much better way to measure this effect, and this is most power spectroscopy. I'm going to uh, tell you a bit about this. Now, I need now to focus uh, for two minutes on the itabium atom, because in my system, we studied itabium. And the situation in itabium is a rather bit complicated than in prasodymium, because we have here two isotopes. So we have the 171 with spin one half. The hyperfine couple is pretty large, but the natural abundance of this material is not very high. The same thing is also for the tabium 173. But in this material, we have very large uh, spin. Now, uh, Kesuya Matsumoto, uh, Mitsumoto uh, did some calculation of the hyperfine coupling, and this is the result. So if you couple the ground state gamma 6 for this material, for instance, Excuse and me, this, Michelle, we have a question, I think, um, Navinder Singh, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Yes. Yeah, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I have a question uh, re related to, uh, so there is a coupling between the F electrons and the nuclear spin, but there is a coupling mm -hmm. of the conduction electrons also with the nuclear spin. So no. what is the strength of these two, uh, comparative strengths of these two interactions? Why this direct interaction of S electrons with the nuclear is not considered? Yeah, OK, so uh, this is a good question because this is the point of my talk. And I'm coming to this point in two, three slides. So in this, in this system here, there is no condo interaction. So we are talking only about a system with hyperfine interaction. So we, call, we don't have condo effect, OK? That's why it's easy to, have, uh, to do, perform these calculations. And I'm going to explain you why, if you have a condo effect, then this situation cannot be seen. So going back to Itabium, I want to say that the uh, calculation, which can be done precisely, give us an hyperfine, uh, let's say, the coupling to the one half, give us a triple ground state with a singlet uh, first excited state at 100 millikelvin. The situation with the spin five half is more compli complex, and then you have a quintet and a septet at 84 millikelvin. Now, 
I mentioned most power spectroscopy, and that's there is a point here because in most power spectroscopy, you can really see this kind of energy splitting directly by measuring uh, the most power uh, transmission over velocity, and you can do perform very nice calculation. This is an example I've taken from this paper because I've been working a lot on tabular rhodium to silicon tube, and this was a calculation done on for this system. Uh, for the uh, for the um, for the source ETB 170, and you expect to have five peaks at a certain magnetic field and four peaks in zero field. But then they measure this, and they they found only one single peak. And so, look, this was a calculation given, and this is very sharp peak. There is no problem. Now, why there is no such effect in this metallic system? And this is the point of my talk, and I now answer the question of uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, this physics was studied, uh, as far as I know, uh, much in the 70s. There is a very nice work by Floquet, for instance, Frossati, one of the first, and then Bonville did a lot of most powers study. So this is about what is this called the slow and fast relaxation regimes in metals. And this is about the interplay between the hyperfine coupling and the condo coupling. So I try now to give you a very simple explanation of what's going on and, and how I do understand this. And uh, you might ask later if you want more details, but I will just uh, try to I simplify that in this picture. So. If we don't have a condo effect, and we are just a simple 4F element, then the nuclei, they couple to the angular momentum of the 4F and gives you a very, uh, the entangled uh, wave function with different energy level. So the hyperfine coupling is much larger than the condo temperature. Now, what is the fluctuations? How strong or how fast are these fluctuations? The fluctuations of the 4F are rather close to the fluctuation of the, of the Lamo period of the nuclei. It's about gigahertz. So they are not fast. But if the 4F couples strongly to the conduction electron, so if the condo effect is huge, let's say more than the hyperfine coupling, which is, let's say, a temperature of 10 Kelvin will be good enough, then they fluctuate so fast that there is no coupling between the 4F and the nuclei. So now you might ask, how fast is this uh, RD fluctuation? This is proportional to the condo temperature. So as I said before, we are of the order of terahertz, or the hundred, thousand, so hundred of gigahertz. Now, what does then, what happen with the magnetic uh, nuclei? So what do they feel is just simple mean field or the mean value of the magnetization of the 4F shell. So what happened, they don't do not couple, but they feel a magnetic field induced by the 4F. To give you an example, if you have uh, an itabium atom and you have uh, a system with a condo effect, then the nuclei uh, feel a magnetic field, which is about 110 Tesla, if the moment of the 4F is one mu bar. So you can imagine to have a materials having one mu bar order state, and these moments polarize the nuclei. Now, to go back and summarize the entire story. If you have strong condo effect, then fluctuation of the 4F, because they do couple with electrons, they are very fast. So they, there is no possibility to couple to the nuclei. So you have only uh, a field induced, uh, so the magnetization induced polarization of the nuclei. If the condo effect is small or zero, then there is a strong coupling between the 4F and the nuclei, 
we give you then wave function, ground state wave function, which, has, which are really entangled. Now, there is a calculation made by Novik in which uh, they work out the most power spectrum for the slow relaxation regime. And you see the different, you can see here all the peaks, but in the fast relaxation regime, if we go out to very high frequency, then we only see the quadrupolar splitting only a few peaks. Now, I now try to answer all the entire question. Uh, if we consider now the Donia phase diagram, at this point, at the critical point, we are always in a position in which the condo temperature is very high. So we are always in the fast relaxation regime. So there is no coupling to the nuclei. So there is no electronuclear quantum critical, critical fluctuations. That's why there is no metallic system in which this effect can be observed at all. And that's why there is no report. Now, why I'm giving you a talk about that is that because there is another way to overcome this problem. And this is frustration. So if you have a, a system, a magnetic system, in which you have a very small condo temperature, uh, but then is frustrated, then you might uh, tune the system to a critical point without having a large condo temperature. So in that case, the, the 4F, they can couple to the nuclei, and then uh, we don't know what's going to happen. Now, you can have geometrical frustration in the, in a, for instance, here, the classical example of a triangular lattice in which the coupling is antiferromagnetic, the third atom cannot, doesn't know what to do. Or you can have a, a more a common situation in which you have a competition between antiferromagnetic and ferromagnetic coupling. This is a typical example in the square lattice. You can have the first uh, exchange interaction being ferromagnetically, but the exchange to the uh, uh, second neighbor is antiferro. So then you have a competition between these two and you might end up in a non-magnetic ground state. And this is exactly what's happened in Itabium copper 4.6 gold. So we found um, a system in which we are at a critical point, but the or both energy scale, the Ekakawai and the Kono interaction, they are very small. Now, this material is cubic. Uh, the Itzebium atoms are on tetra tetrahedra. So you might have geometrical frustration because of this. And the system Itzebium copper for gold is antiferromagnetic. So it's here in the phase diagram. If you add uh, more copper, then you can tune this transition temperature to zero to a quantum critical point at a concentration or gold concentration around 0 0.3 to 0 0.4. These data are from uh, this publication from uh, Carly. And uh, we got a sample from the same group, which is now located here in the phase diagram and is this is our measurements of the E capacity. And these measurements of the E capacity here indicate the phase transition at this point, which are this point, uh, was were measured by Karlik and co-workers. Now, how do we know uh, if the system is uh, or the nuclei are important or not? We look also in the literature and found that the most power experiment were done on this material um, in the, um, 1992, I think by Bonville. And they measure a frequency of the relaxation rate well above the ordinary temperature of something 50 gigas, not very fast. So this first indicate that there is a, a possibility that fluctuation by going to a quantum critical point are slowing down, and then we might observe very low uh, relaxation rates. But what we did was with the help of uh, Pietro Carretta, who measured the uh, 
NQR and NMR, he measured this, uh, the relaxation one over T1, T, so the spin like the relaxation rate down to very low temperature, 20 millikelvin. So we were able to calculate the fluctuation of the uh, isotopes of the 4F HRB173 from the muon relaxation rate by just adjusting the uh, geromagnetic ratio and hyperfine coupling. And what we end up that we have at the critical point, so in the phase diagram in this region, a fluctuation or relaxation rate or something like three gigahertz. So this is very important because that's proof that this much in this material there can be coupling between the nuclei and the and the 4F. Now to show you how we uh, know that they there is this coupling, I would like first to show you some basic properties of this material. That's in principle what we have measured. And then at the end, the signature of this uh, electronuclear effect. Now, first I said that uh, we are here in a situation in which the antiferromagnetic uh, flat, uh, state compete with ferromagnetic. How do we know this? First, we know that because from these uh, measurements, it turned out that the system uh, show very strong ferromagnetic fluctuation. Then what we did was to measure the AC susceptibility in exactly this material here, exactly this sample. And we, what you observe is when you lower the temperature, susceptibility increases up to a point in which we see like a level of a little maximum, which could be due to a kind of a very short range uh, uh, ordering. But the, what is important here is the number. So the susceptibility is very high. To compare the susceptibility to other system close to a ferromagnetic instability, I plotted here the susceptibility of Itabio rhodium 2 silicon 2. And you see that it's very, very similar, and these values are very high. So that means that this material is very close to a ferromagnetic instability, meaning there must be a, a competition between antiferro and ferro. Now, if you look at the um, Curivise low temperature behavior, then we have a relatively small Curivise temperature, which tell us that we have a very weak Erkakawai interaction or the exchange interaction. And also the fluctuating moment is very large. That tell us that there can be so be condo effect, otherwise the fluctuating moment will be lower. We also look at the magnetic field dependent of the susceptibility. So to see whether we see any kind of ferromagnetic state. We couldn't see any hysteresis, but this strong peak, which also indicate that the system is very close to ferromagnetic instability. And finally, what we measure was the magnetization. And magnetization measure at two Kelvin is uh, plotted here in blue. And what you see in green is a Brillouin function, assuming that we have no condo effect, it's just a local moment. And you see that it's very well uh, matching. The difference here is due to the uh, short range correlation. And when you go at lower temperature, magnetization lower temperature is even higher because of the ferromagnetic correlations. So to summarize all these results, we see now here that approaching the quantum critical point, we have ferromagnetic fer uh, correlation measured. We don't have a clear magnetic order. We have rather very weak um, short range ordering. And the condo effect and air cacao interaction are below one Kelvin or roughly one Kelvin. So the system uh, is, let's say, looks like a local moment frustrated system. Now, before showing you the uh, most important results, I would like to remind you of a very simple concept, which is the heat capacity of a multiple level system of a two level system, which is known as the Schottky effect. It's very simple. 
uh, if you have, uh, for instance, here two level system and you measure or calculate the heat capacity between them, you end up with such a nice peak at the N energy, which is proportional to the difference between these two levels. The same thing is if you have different um, levels. And what is important here is this coefficient here. So the high temperature tail of this effect of the heat capacity is proportional to one over T square. This is a pretty well-defined function. This is uh, well measured and known. And uh, to give you an example is uh, in a Itebium based system, I have chosen this material measured also by our group. So if we consider that these two level system are the uh, nuclei levels, one half and five half, they are split by the Zeeman effective magnetic field. Then you measure the capacity at low temperature, forget about what's going on at higher temperature. You see this increase of C divided by T. This increase here is clearly proportional to a coefficient divided by T to a cube. You see how all data are on the same very clear line. This is a standard effect in all systems with nuclear uh, spin in which uh, you measure heat capacity below one Kelvin. You see always the nuclear heat capacity growing as a high temperature tail of a Schottky. Why I'm going to show this uh, is that because you can, for our material, itebium copper gold, precisely calculate this effect. We know the moments, we know the hyperfine coupling, we know everything. And this was done by Mitsumoto. You see. Excuse me, that, Mama, I have a yes. question from Chimia. Okay. Chimia, have you want to unmute and ask a question? Yes, hi, hi Mario. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, I just want to uh, uh, orient myself, uh, if I may, just uh, uh, about this material. So you mentioned that it's uh, FCC, is, is that right? The, uh, so you mean the Sebium copper gold is a cubic, it's a cubic, a cubic size, it's the beryllium gold five. Right, so um, electronically, does one know that uh, the ytterbium has a doublet? In, yes, uh, well, we know from uh, previous uh, studies mm -hmm. and the, the ground state is most possibly a gamma seven, mm -hmm. a gamma six, sorry. Mm -hmm. This is also shown here in magnetization, if I just go back. So for a gamma six, you expect a 1.33 saturation moment. We have a 1.4. For a gamma seven, you would expect 1.7. And that's why we, I, we think that is a gamma six ground state, yeah. Okay, thank you. And and is there only one type of uh, F-electron site? Yes, site? It, it is, yeah. Okay, thank you. So um, going back to the Schottky E capacity of other nuclei, we expect an effect to be seen below 200 millikelvin with a tail which goes up to one. So if I would plot C divided by T over uh, over T, then uh, in a log scale, I will see one over T cube. But then these are our measurements. Now, you can see here already that there is a big difference between this behavior and this behavior. Here, all curves lie on the same line. Here, we have a huge change. Now, before I continue to analyze this data, I would like to mention that we can measure the heat capacity here down to 30 millikelvin. But for this uh, plot and for the analysis, I have taken out all data which have an error bar larger than 2% because this was a delicate issue. And then I didn't want to choose data we can, uh, that can have a, an error bar, pretty large error bar. And you see here the difficulties in measuring this is because the E capacity is huge. So if we would follow the yellow line, we will end up with, with 100 joule per Kelvin square mole. Yeah. So now we go step by step and we uh, analyze and look at, take a look at the data first in zero field. 
first, so this is a plot of C divided by T over T in a log log uh, uh, plot. Now, in this configuration, so at zero field, the system doesn't order. There is this 70 millikelvin very weak ordering. So you see that the short range correlation that start being important here, there's a huge increase on the heat capacity. And then starting the V18, possibly is because of the nuclear effect. Now, how do we know this is that we can apply a little magnetic field. So what we apply just 0 0.5 Tesla and we suppress the ordering for sure. Then we see that the C divided by T start to get a constant as you would expect for uh, standard metallic system, but then the nuclear effect kicks in. This is a clear effect starting below 0 0.2. Yeah. What is awkward here is not that we see this effect because we want we were expecting to see this, but it's the power law. So the power law here is not one over T cube as in every other metals with ethereum is one of t square now what we did was to apply a little bit so it's much weaker we applied a little bit higher fields and then uh, we observe now this behavior to the c over t getting costa but then the nuclear is uh, starting to be important then we have again a power law still not one of the tq now, the, the, the point is, if the nuclear moments are completely decoupled, then they, we should observe here for sure one of the Q, as in every other metallic turbo system. But we do not. No, by going up in fields, we eventually we go up to five Tesla. This is the orange line. So this line here is one to the power 2.75. And then eventually, by 10 Tesla, we recover what we do really expect. We suppress completely the short range, uh, the fluctuations, and we observe the standard one over TQ. Now, the, one of the questions that I got from students say, okay, yeah, but here you can have a little error bar. Are you sure that this is a... I would like to mention this is a log, log, log. So the difference between this point or the this increase and this point here is huge. It's something like 30 joule per Kelvin square mole. You can't explain that just by, I don't know, wrong calibration, your thermometer, uh, you got a wrong sample, I don't know. This is a huge effect. And the difference between this curve here and this here is also huge. So I have been looking at this data, sorry. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Sorry, I kind of... My my slide are just stuck. So I try to explain this. Uh, so we were thinking about this problem, and then we end up with a little. Uh, sorry, we have a question here from Claudio Casanova. Yes. Claudio, uh, sorry, I'm just playing devil's advocate. What happens at 15 and 20 Tesla by chance? Does it? Stay yeah, if you would apply 20 Tesla, you will see. Uh, the heat capacity C divided by T being even lower at high temperature, and then one over TQ. Okay. Thank at you. some point, you will recover. I mean, you will see the shot key peak. Yeah. Um, so I do apologize. I have a bit problem by switching. Okay. So. Um, we try to explain this or try to understand this, but it's rather complex. So what I did was to find a very simple theoretical form uh, explanation to this behavior. And what I did was to simulate the e-capacity by assuming that we have a two level system, but this, these levels here are pretty, are not sharp, but they have a width. So they are just uh, used a model by Schotte and Schotte which is a resonant Levens model that sometimes is used for condo system. And its principle calculate the heat capacity of two um, levels with the Laurentian shape, assuming that this width 
is um, given by the quantum critical fluctuation. And the, indeed, I could reproduce the behavior observed. In fact, if you have a zero field, you can see the, the, the first line, the purple line is uh, one over T square. When you increase the field, so you split up this, you uh, enlarge the difference between the, the level or you reduce the, uh, the width of the, of the Lorentzian shape, you recover the one over T cube. This is, of course, a very simplified model. I don't want to now say that this is the true, but uh, the, my understanding of the entire process is that we have a couple uh, electron nuclei uh, with the ethabium isotopes. They form levels, hyperfine levels. They have a certain, um, they are not uh, well defined because of quantum fluctuation, we got the system at the critical point, and this fluctuation can be seen in the broadening of the energy levels. Now, I have uh, a little problem here because I cannot change my slide. I will try to uh, reopen the file. Give me a second. Have you frozen as well, Marlon? Yes. So we've lost Manuel. Hopefully he will be able to rejoin us in a moment. So sorry, Andrew, I'm back. Great. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Yes. Uh, Um, um, We can hear you, I think. Say, say something again on that. So I'm all connected, but... Uh, yes, we, we, you sent a message asking, did we hear? We can hear. Um, we're not seeing any slides. So, okay. We can see you perfectly. <laughs>
And why are you still there? So I fear we may have oh. lost one well again. Yeah, Hopefully. I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh. Uh, I got the the uh, presentation got stuck at some point when okay. there was a question. So I share the screen again. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Great. You can see a screen again. So sorry about that. This is always uh, never happen just when you give a talk. Okay, that works. Uh, can I continue? Yes, of course. Okay. So uh, I was saying that um, we try to simulate this with a simple model and it worked. Um, now what we did also, there is a double check you can do and is by using magnetization. So at very high fields, we have a standard behavior. So we have a standard shot key and uh, it looks like we, the magnetic field decouple the nuclei with the electron again. So what we can assume is that this uh, magnetization here should be seen in the coefficient of the E capacity. In fact, if I take the coefficient, so by uh, taking the slope of this uh, fit, then I can plot them on this, on the magnetization, and I can build the entire magnetization down to lower temperature. So the black data are the measured data, and the red line is the fit of the data. What I can do, I can extract from all this point, all the magnetic field, my A coefficient, subtract this from my data, and then look if this is the nuclear contribution, what it should get. And then you can see here the high field is zero, of course, it's very constant, T divided by T. By low temperature, there is still a very large increase. So this is what I would expect if there would be no coupling between the electrons and the nuclei. But here is it clear that there is a strong coupling at low field. Now what you can do, you can uh, calculate precisely the entropy by using the fitting functions. And uh, this picture is a bit complicated, but what you see here is the entire, this line is the entire nuclear entropy you expect for both isotopes. And this is Erlen2 is the ground state of the 4F. So this is, will be the entropy you expect when uh, you have the, all the nuclei and the electronic state um, uh, completely um, when the entropy is um, quenched. So, and uh, what I plot here in the insert is the total entropy, which are these points, but also the nuclear entropy. And if you see the purple line, the nuclear entropy reach the full entropy around six, 0 0.6 Kelvin. It means that this is the temperature below which this coupling is getting strong and important. Now, to uh, conclude, we have uh, the first metallic example in which we could observe uh, quantum critical fluctuation at the quantum critical point, which are not purely electronic, but are given from state which are entangled with the, uh, from, so electronic state, which are entangled with the nuclear moment. The signature are clearly in the E capacity. And uh, this is possible because in this material, the condo temperature is very small. Otherwise, the condo temperature, very high at condo temperature, will kill this effect. Uh, the evidence we have now is in the E capacity, but um, we have indirect evidence from the uh, from published data when in the NQR and muon spin resonance measurements. It would be good to do most power, but uh, nowadays it's not very easy to find the source and second to have a 
a dilution refrigerator which can go to down to 50 millikelvin and in which you can do most power spectroscopy. So at the end, I would like to thank my co-workers, in particular Jacinta, she's a PhD student, she did all the e-capacity measurements. Then uh, also Daniel is a PhD student and in collaboration with the Elena Asinger group, in particular with Javier Landesa, they did all the magnetization and AC susceptibility measurements. The entire idea behind this was by Christoph Geibel, who was the first to notice the difference in the E capacity, and he knows about the entire story of the slow and fast relaxation. That's why he uh, was mentioned that to me at the early time. We spent three years working on this project. Then I would like to thank um, Mauro Giovannini, because he is the guy behind the sample growing. So he managed to grow this material, which are not very easy to grow. Uh, Julian Sereni, who actually uh, is one of the people that work in the last year on these systems. And uh, he, we had uh, lots of number of conversation on that, and we work on this project together. Uh, Kesuya Mitsumoto did all the hyperfine calculation, and Pietro Carretta helped us to um, recalculate the fluctuation rate of the Tabion system from his data on from the muon spin resonance. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you for the attention. I'm sorry for the for the little break. Okay. Great. Thank you, Manuel, for a wonderful talk. Okay. Hey, questions? Questions in the room? Okay, Andrew Huxley has a question. Hi, Andrew. Uh, hi, Manuel. Nice talk. Thanks. Um, you, you, you were distinguishing your work from the work on lithium, lithium holmium fluoride because you were dealing with a metal. That's yes. correct. Yes. Could, could you say a little bit more about that, that distinction, why, why it's special? Uh, why is special lithium holmium fluoride or why? The, the differences between what you found and in, in what was found in lithium holmium fluoride. Yeah, so um, I try now to, uh, again, uh, I try to go back to my slide. So in lithium holmium fluoride, you have a situation similar to prosodymium. So you have a strong coupling from the holmium because I think the spin is seven half. Uh, of the nuclear spin. So you have, uh, and uh, uh, let's say, an entangled uh, states, yeah, uh, which is uh, the lithium homophrolite is in such sense similar to our itabium because in both systems, the hyperfine coupling, so the electron coupled indeed to the, uh, to the nuclei. In all other metals, you have a, a condo temperature with uh, a loud strong fluctuation that kills this effect. So in such sense, uh, lithium onmophoride is closer to this material. So what in this material, in fact, you build up these um, couple levels and the same thing in prosodymium, the same thing in olmium. Uh, the difference between the so there is another important difference is the fact that in lithium on your fluor, uh, fluoride, you have a fi magnetic field, which uh, induce the transition. So you have an easy, you know, you know the story better than me, but uh, you have a, a transfer field in the apply in an easy magnet. Uh, and that's, this is the uh, tuning parameter. In our system, it in zero field. So, uh, so that there is technically from the, um, let's say theoretical point of view, are uh, two different system. In our system is absolutely no easing. So the, the ground state, the tabular ground state is not uh, an easing ferromagnet. It's pretty isotropic. Is that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, we have two questions, um, remote questions. Let me see who they are. Um, I can't see who's raised their hand. 
Um, okay, Chiyao <laughs> has a question. I have a question. Um, sorry, I. Okay, got it back. Um, yeah, so my nice talk. Uh, I was wondering. Uh, I guess along the same spirit as the previous question, uh, how does this uh, nuclear contribution to the uh, entropy, uh, in which way is it distinct from you know the other system you worked on, ytterbium, rhodium two, silicon two, um, uh, or is there some common feature as well as far as the nuclear contribution involvement is concerned? Um. So, um, yeah, well, I can give you a more experimental answer. Mm -hmm. um, so the, uh, the, 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 in so th the most important difference is, uh, I'm sorry, I need to go back to the final part of my talk to answer the question. So is the difference between, um, this behavior here yeah. Now, if you assume you take this system, you take Itabium Rodin 2, uh, Silicon 2, all the other Itabium condo or system with condo temperature, you measure the nuclear E capacity, you extract the A coefficient, you see in all system this behavior, so 1 over T cube, you end up by plotting um, all these points on the magnetization. So the internal field filled by the uh, nuclei is just the magnetization of the surrounding. Mm -hmm. So if I would plot the magnetization of it, there is a plot in one publication, don't remember which one from Philip. Magnetization over the, a, the square root of the A coefficient, they, all the points lie exactly on here. If I will do this in this system, it would never work. First, because I cannot feed the data with one over T cube. And second, because there is this, uh, the, 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 the entropy of below this area is not purely um, either, is not the sum of the nuclear plus the electrons, but is the, uh, um, let's say the couple entropy. So it's difficult to split them into, it, it, it's, the concept is similar to the um, entangled. So it's not the, that the, you can, the wave function are not the product of two different wave functions. Yeah? So they are really uh, coupled. And that's why it's not difficult to split them. If I would measure this in the heat, tab rhodium equal two, I can tell you, this is the nuclear heat capacity. This is the 4F heat capacity. We did it in the past. Do you remember all the scaling uh, and so on? But in this material, I cannot do this because they are a couple. I think this is the main difference. But if I could follow up on that, um, it seems to me that the temperature range that is measured here, uh, it's higher than what was looked at the ytterbium rhodium to silicon to. Is that, is that right? Because I, I think the nuclear spin entropy is saturated uh, in YRS by the time you get up to like 10 millikelvin. Yes. And, and so- Because you don't have hyperfine coupling. Whether the different behavior also reflects, you know, the different temperature window that uh, is being looked at. Yeah, this is correct. So if you, this is exactly correct. So in YRS, if you would measure 0.5, Tesla, mm -hmm. you would never see such a huge increase in the in the nuclear entropy at 0 0.2 millikelvin. The entropy at 0 0.5 will be here, just below 40, 50 millikelvin. Mm -hmm. But then, by increasing the field, you will see this increase. But there is a big difference. A big difference. I mean, for this energy scale between the case here, in which you see that's already at 200 millikelvin, in YRS, you are right. So the the entropy will be below, let's say, uh, 50 millical. This is, this is a good point, yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, John Saunders, you have a question. Oh, John. Very nice to see you.
Hi, sorry, sorry about that. Um, Manuel, um, could you take us through the broadened uh, two-level system uh, model again? In particular, I noticed that you have you introduced an effective field. Uh, with, it's got a factor of forty in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where does that factor of forty come from? And maybe talk in, in, in uh, about the model a little bit more. Yeah. Um, yes. So this is. Um, so usually, as experimental, I would say this is just a phenomenological model. But uh, yeah, this is. Uh, um, so the if you look at the energy splitting here, is something like ten. So the, the parameters I use for this is something like 10 milli Kelvin. That's because there is a long tail here. So when I try to simulate the heat capacity by entering the same, or roughly the same energy scale in temperature. So I have adjust the, let's say the width and the quilt by a factor so that it could reproduce the same measurement 0.5125 was like just, fin just uh, um, now I was asking myself, why do you get uh, contribution up to here? Now this is a bit misleading because this is a log log plot. So the contribution you see here is almost zero, it's very small. So because the Laurentian have a very long tail, so then when you work out the heat capacity, assuming the effective heat will be zero, and when you work out the heat capacity of this model, then you will start at already one Kelvin to see a little bit of the capacity one. Now, the fact of 40 to answer your question is only to give me the possibility to write the same number, 0 0.51, to scale in a similar way as I did in the, uh, there is, um, so this will be like a one Tesla, like 25 millitesla. Uh, so, but this is, uh, let's say, um, maybe, uh, it's good that you ask this because this is the effective field felt by inside. So, and I, I, this is the factor, let's say, um, between the applied field and the effective field uh, felt by this um, model, by these two levels. Uh, don't ask me now. Um, and in, the, in this in this uh, in this case, I can reproduce it. I I'm not claiming that this is uh, perfectly matching the reality, but it's not far from it. Is well, it used to, when you once you see effect that uh, that that in a high profile system, the, the the field experienced by the nucleus is is enhanced, is larger than the externally applied field. It looks a bit unusual that uh, the field is smaller by a factor of forty. Was that a misunderstanding of your model? Uh, no, no, this is okay. This is also what I was asking. And um, um, so you are asking why there is no um, perfect absolute matching between the value here and the value here. Um, and let's pass and, uh, and, and move on. Uh, I, I didn't think about this. Um... Okay, we have another question from Frenke Bangmar, if I pronounced that correctly. Hi, uh, thanks Hi. Manuel for the talk. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned at the start that there are multiple isotopes of a terbium and that they have different nuclear spins and hyperfine yes. constants. Yes. So I was wondering, I'm assuming that you have a, a bit of all the different isotopes in your sample. Would your results be different if you had only one? Oh yes, of course. I and how so. would they be different then? Um, so the uh, the main process is pretty local. So the hyperfine coupling is local. So it, if you would have, uh, if you add, for instance, one hundred percent itabium, one hundred seventy three with spin five half then uh, this effect would be, let's say, much stronger in absolute value. But the, in the, uh, the nature of the effect is the same because it's pretty local. So in, in our case, we need to rescale everything divided by 30% of isotope in the entire system. So you have uh, here in this material, you have 13% uh, of Itabium 173 and 
16% or 171. But then if you add uh, 1% of 173, now of course the effect will be uh, will be like six times larger. But the temperature dependent or the same um, will be the same yeah? because it's a local, the hyperfine coupling is a local, is as a local nature. So it also doesn't really matter that they have different signs for the hyperfine constant. Yeah. Oh, well, um, if you want now to write down a complete model at a quantum critical point for this, then it might matter. But uh, I guess that for the simple explanation of having fluctuation or broadening of the couple, it doesn't. Uh, because okay. what it counts for the capacity is the excited, so the difference between the energy level. Yeah which is roughly 100 millikelv in both cases, yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, work. Okay, we have a couple of questions in the room here. One from um, Chris Coleman. Yes. Hi, Manuel, a very nice talk. A question to you, you've used a simple dipole hyperfine coupling, but, um, uh, uh, particularly in, a, in uh, 173 uh, atterbium, uh, there's a very strong atomic deformation. And I believe that the uh, hyperfine spectroscopy shows that there's, for example, a very large octopole moment. Don't you think one should take into account these other couplings uh, between the electrons and the uh, nuclear moment? And, and could you perhaps extract them from your measurements? Um, for yeah. it, uh, what do you uh, ask? Okay, I, I um, guess I'm pointing out that in in hyperfine spectroscopy measurements, they find quite substantial coefficients that couple higher order moments of the nucleus. It could, it could be about higher that. order moments of the electrons. Um, and so I'm a bit concerned that 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 uh, it's a major oversimplification to just talk about uh, dipole couplings. Um, uh, well, I don't know exactly. Need to check. So I I don't know whether this is will be important for the general idea, but it's correct if you have a. It, 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 it's relevant to the whole question of whether there's enough gas in the hyperfine couplings to start producing entangled states. Um, yeah, there is definitely, but I don't know precisely. So the calculation done by Mitsumoto, they never mentioned this. It was done by the pole, I guess, for coupling. Um, okay. Something. I don't know. I can't, I can't answer this question. So it's... Uh, yes, I'll <laughs> hand over to yeah. Ben. He's also going to yeah. ask a question. Hello, Manuel. Hi. Um, if I understand you correctly, you get the entanglement because you've got a electronic energy scale that is comparable to the nuclear hyperfine coupling scale. Yes, and you can. I wonder, is there other electronic scales that could also become comparable and give you entanglement, um, give you similar entanglement? Of course, the, I guess it's very difficult to turn the Fermi energy let that low. Um, potentially, it's it's still possible, but it would require quite some fine tuning. But are there any other en electronic energy scales that could display similar effects? Um, I don't think so. I don't can, cannot imagine having. Uh, so, for instance, now thinking about what Pierce asked, assuming we add uh, quadrupolar degrees of freedom in the ground state that we don't have, but then they might play a role, um, but not in this system. So um, first, because we don't have it, because we have a, a, a double ground state, a Kramer's double ground state. And second, because uh, uh, we have only 
13% of uh, these isotopes. So if we have a complete lattice, then they might be uh, important, but uh, I can't think of any other electronic energy scale that can be... Um, but if I, if I um, hypothesize to, to have a Fermi energy that's at as low as one Kelvin, maybe, then the same would happen oh, without yeah. the thunder effect, right? <laughs> this is a semantic question. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe this is depends on the. Uh, so say again. So if you would have, if you add like an Fermi energy of one Kelvin. And so I understand if I, if I understand you correctly, you've got the entanglement because you've got very comparable energy scales. So you're essentially not in an adiabatic limit of, of of either of the energy scales. So can you? But. It's the condo energy that is very low here, but that, that allows you to have the, the entanglement of the 4F electrons yes. nuclear moments. Yeah, independently, yeah, from the condo energy. Uh, so it, this is, the, the entire physics is yet complicated because it's about free energy scale, as far as I can say. One is the air caca Y. The other is the condo, and the third is the hyperfine. The hyperfine, of course, the, the one that has a lower, the most lower energy scale. What, then, uh, what role plays the RKKY in this game? So if you have a strong RKKY, you order the entire 4F systems. And then first, there is no quantum criticality, no quantum critical fluctuation. That's it. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, but can you imagine going further away from the magnetically ordered phase and keep your condo temperature at one Kelvin? The same would still happen, wouldn't it? Yeah, you have a, a prosodymus system with a well-defined, hyperfine scheme. So, so the prosodymus system can be also metallic, but the metallic, uh, uh, the metallic uh, electronic state is independent from the local energy scales. So if you would measure the E capacity, let's say the gamma, some of the coefficient of the electronic state is very small. You have a very strong coupling in the prosodium system. You see this kind of uh, coupling, hyperfine coupling, and uh, that's it. You can have a magnetic ordering, quadrupolar ordering, uh, different energy scales, but the trick is that this system usually, they will never go to a quantum critical point because the EKKY is proportional to the J, to the exchange square. So if you have a small magnetic moment already between the 4F, then the coupling is square, so then you get very strong coupling. Now you need to find, let's say, um, say a prasiodemus system, which is frustrated and metallic, and then you have very low, uh, let's say, energy, um, uh, so, sorry, Femi energy. You have a very low zero condo temperature. You have a frustrated system at the quantum critical point. In that system, you should find the same physics. Okay. But this, this would be a system in which really the 4F are completely decoupled. Yeah. But you are right. So it, it's right. If you have a prosodymus system, condo temperature is zero, you have a hyperfine uh, scheme. And if you manage to have no magnetic ordering in that material or be at the quantum critical point, then uh, you will see similar effect. But I cannot imagine uh, that in that case, if you will have, for instance, quadrupolar exchange or quadrupolar moments, then you might think of having the quadrupolar degrees of freedom involved in this story, which is going to be more, more complex. But I cannot think of any other electronic energy states or important for this. So, uh, okay, thank you. It, yeah. Okay, I think um, Chimiao, you had another question. Uh, yes, thank you, Andrew. Um, 
So uh, Manuel, I, I was wondering, uh, actually this is the first time I'm hearing about this ethereum copper gold. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah. I, I was wondering how much uh, is known about the underlying uh, quantum critical features since you mentioned uh, a few times about this system being close to a quantum yeah. critical point. Yeah. Uh, and the phase diagram that's showing on the screen indicates that as well. Yes. Um, so uh, indeed, there is a, a lot of work done by Julian Sereni, Kurlik. So the mostly, if I go back to mostly, is in this paper. There are many papers around about similar systems, stable nickel and uh, gold, and so on. All the systems are near, so they are magnetically ordered and near a quantum critical point. In this paper, they, for the first time, they measure this, uh, let's say, uh, increase in the sum effect coefficient, the low temperature, indicating that this material is close to um, instability. Uh, what uh, was done about quantum criticality is, um, in my opinion, one of the best work in this year by Carretta, in which they measure exactly the uh, 1 over T12 at the NQR on the copper and the mu spin resonance on, this, on one of the samples close to this area. And what I have found really that this, this system is extremely fluctuating to the lowest point. Mm -hmm. Now they have been interpret this to with a um, SCR theory of ferromagnetism uh, because this line can reproduce this, this, this uh, temperature increase one to the power four third which is expected for the ferromagnetic um, quantum critical point. Um, but we then uh, find out that when you go lower in energy, then uh, there is something wrong with the capacity. So, but this work here is maybe the most important one concerning really the behavior, the fluctuation, the quantum critical point. But uh, could I follow up on this? So. So for instance, uh, uh, what's the temperature dependence of resistivity? That's one aspect. And the other is, is there anything like uh, uh, B over T scaling in the magnetization? No, no the, uh, there was no this because, um, um, so this system is pretty anomalous. I tried to explain this. So uh, the, the condor temperature is very small. The, res the quality of the sample is not a good enough that you can extract m very much from the resistivity, as far as I remember. Mm -hmm. I have one paper here. Um, and it behaves really like a, a almost a local moment system. So what is, uh, so as far as I remember, there is no scaling about the quantum critical behavior because the only thing that we measure low temperatures are the heat capacity this year, and uh, I think I'm not sure about resistivity. Yeah. But but you show that the magnetization uh, results, and it seems to me like what was done for serum copper six gold could also be attempted here just to get some. Sense. Uh, no, that's pretty. So I don't remember exactly the uh, the susceptibility measure on serum copper gold, but uh, this is the uh, most important measurements here. So this is a zero field AC susceptibility. Now what happened here is the crystal field is fine, it's okay. But then uh, you see here, uh, this is to give you, because you know well, uh, itabio rodent to silicon two, I plotted also here the same AC susceptibility on YRS and you see they are very, very similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the absolute value are changing because the ground state is not a, in YRS might be gamma seven and here is gamma six, but nevertheless, this absolute value are exactly the same, same behavior, same, same uh, uh, in YRS, the fluctuating moment is much lower, mm -hmm. but also in YRS, you have a very small uh, Curie wise temperature. So this, it, the, the combination of these measurements with these measurements, uh, where is this, um, sorry with these measurements tell us that the system is really strongly fluctuating and fluctuation, they have ferromagnetic 
uh, are ferromagnetic in nature. The, the fact that you are arriving to the critical point for the non-ferromagnetic state, uh, so we drive the conclusion that uh, this critical point is driven by the competition between them because the order and moment is not screened by the cone effect. Mm -hmm. There is no, as far as I can see, there is no other way of understanding this. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I, I, I found a very interesting system. It's because it's cubic and therefore yeah. the comparison with both YRS and Serum Copper 6 gold. Yeah. And the ground state is now the quarter, uh, a, a quartet. So yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. Well. Okay, I don't see any. Oh, we have another question here from Chris Hulu. Thanks. Hi, Manuel. Thanks for uh, an Hi, Chris. Um, I'm a, I'm a little bit confused by the concentration on bare scales in this argument about invisibility of this effect. I mean, might I not argue that since I am at a quantum critical point, I know that I have a spin stiffness that's going to zero, and maybe I have an effective mass in the Fermi liquid that's going to infinity. And then I couple it to this system of nuclear spins and they apply a perturbation of a certain size, but relative to something whose stiffness is vanishing, might I not say that I ought generically to be susceptible to that perturbation because everything that I'm coupling to is so soft and it doesn't really matter what the bare condo scale was because the nuclear moments can talk directly to the soft magnetic fluctuations. Or is there something wrong with that argument? Uh, um, so I think the only thing that so if I follow because you might have to repeat again uh, I try to follow but uh, you start saying that the system has a non-magnetic ground state yeah with a let's say heavy Fermi but it, this is not entire the case so the condo temperature is not uh, large so you have a moderate um, let's say heavy fermion and um, a part of that you are correct um, but i don't see why why they if there are soft uh, fluctuation given by the uh, uh, electronic states. I don't see why the nuclei cannot couple to this fluctuation if the fluctuation has the same frequency. So it's a. But but then would I not would I not generally then expect to see coupling to the nuclei perturbing the phase diagram near what used to be the critical point purely because that critical point is very soft. So, my from my point of view, at least what I understand is, when you go down here in the frequency, or say you would assume you would have an experiment, uh, neutral scattering or most power, whatever you can measure the relaxation time of your four F. Now, at high temperature, you might have very fast relaxation time of fifty gigahertz. Then you go down here the critical point, they slow down mm -hmm. to a range of three gigahertz that we that was measured, in which is proportional similar to the Lamo frequency of the nuclei. Now, because the frequency are similar, then you allow the coupling. If they uh, so, I can't not really answer uh, whether the fact that they are softening is not allowing the coupling to the nuclei. I don't know. Um, so I, I'm assuming that this softening, the fact that you are getting slower fluctuation and you have this energy of the of the 4F level being broadened, then this is uh, this makes it different when you measure, for instance, the capacity. And there must be a coupling because the effect we measure so I cannot say if it's possible or not, but the fact we do measure here is huge. 
there must be uh, a yeah, yeah, sure. my, my argument was sort of the other way. It was when, when you said it was almost impossible to get this, I, that was the bit that I didn't understand. I'd have thought that softening should happen in the generically. In the no, okay, no, sorry, this is a misunderstanding. So if you have, a, um, let's say, what is the phase diagram? So if you had, uh, if you had a condo system in which fluctuation are terahertz, Gira and the coupling with the conduction is so strong, then the nuclei they don't even see this because is that you know the, what they see is just a, a mean a mean value of the entire magnetization around them because the four F are fluctuating too fast. But in this material, when you go down here, you go from you don't have a condo I scaled very high. So the fluctuation here are 50 gigahertz, you go down, you reach very free gigahertz, and this is exactly the point, as you said, softening down allows you the coupling. So in principle, you are correct. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I think um, with a view to the time, we should um, thank Manuel for a Great talk and lots of um, very interesting discussion. I have to thank. Uh, never expect to go up to 4.30. Okay, actually in England it's 4.30, but. I'm afraid we didn't hear what you said, Manuel, because you were clapping. Could you repeat? No, I'm saying I'm glad that uh, we managed to have uh, to use the entire discussion time. It never happened to me before, <laughs> but I was glad to receive so many questions. This was nice. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic, thank you. And